Thanks everybody for joining. Really appreciate everybody being here. My name is Richard. I work um, at AWS Mobile, um, part of a team that builds basically solutions for mobile and web developers looking to build on top of AWS. Um, an engineer on the team, I actually launched both AWS Amplify as well as AWS AppSync. And today I'm going to deep dive into uh, basically a project that we've been working on for a better part of two years, coordinated across like seven or eight different teams. Um, so this is titled Data-Driven Mobile and Web Apps, but really what the motivation and the ethos behind this is about getting data from AWS backend into mobile and web apps in a way that makes it easier for developers to build like unique and compelling experiences. So just to kind of like talk about the motivation for this project when we were working on it, um, you know, many of you might have heard of AppSync, might have heard of Amplify, might have heard of GraphQL, things like that. Um, but Ultimately, if you've never used the tools or you look into in other times, uh, what you end up with is a couple of use cases and a lot of complexity that ends up getting pushed down to the developers of mobile and web apps these days if they're building on top of AWS. So when we talk to customers, we, we usually hear when they're building uh, either a PWA or they're building like a hybrid app with React Native or they're building something like a, um, a native app on iOS or Android, they, they have use cases that tend to fall into two buckets, and many times they overlap with each other, which is quite interesting. Um, the first is usually low latency messages. And I'm sure if I ask for a show of hands, everybody in here that has a mobile phone, I'm going to get 100%, hopefully. Um, but you've probably got some banking apps. You've got chat apps. Uh, you might have shared collaboration apps, which could be things like um, something like a a whiteboarding app that you're sharing with each other, or it could be some next generation stuff like AR and VR apps. And the common thing with these things that everybody has in today's society is they want things immediately, right? Like if you've got a social media app and somebody like a politician or one of your friends does a message or a post, you want to know about the results of that immediately, right? Because everybody wants results today. Or if you're chatting with a friend or a loved one, um, and not just for convenience, but you might actually have security or financial reasons why you need to, get, need to get notified immediately, right? These things are quite important to how businesses move. But then at the same time, many of us ha are offline more than we think about it, right? So in some cases, like I used to live in New York City, I'd be in the subway all the time. I would hate it whenever any one of my apps did not work on the subway, um, which happens more than often. Um, but the truth is, like, you know, we're in a big hotel like this with lots of people on Wi-Fi. Networks aren't really great, especially when you're transitioning to, to different uh, locations. Uh, if you travel um, to other parts of the world, the infrastructure isn't as great these days. And no matter how great we think it is, you know, the providers are always trying to push hardware to the edges to make these things better. And what's pretty interesting is like, you know, those same use cases like chat messages or um, if I wanted to read like a news story when I'm offline and then comment on it, I expect like the mental model of me as a user to um, adhere to those rules. So what I mean by that, by hearing those rules, I, I expect safety in the system so that when I want to make updates to data that I'm entering, that it's not lost. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. So um, what I'm going to talk about is a couple of things like the history of like how people deal with this, um, mainly caches. Uh, if you've built a mobile and web app, um, people talk about caches all the time, but they don't really think about like what that means. Um, and what that comes down to is developer ergonomics. Uh, fundamentally showing up in the different programming models and what we force these developers to do. Um, then if we're talking about some of the applications that I mentioned before, uh, where you've effectively got shared uh, objects across multiple users in your system, you inevitably are going to end up with some concurrency challenges, right? And usually when we think about concurrency, we're talking about distributed systems on the back end, like Lambda functions or things like that. We're usually not thinking about the writers to our systems themselves. I'm going to talk about how GraphQL helps with these problems in depth. It actually gives us a ton of advantages that we usually don't see. Um, and then understanding how this fits into the new thing we released, which is called Amplify Data Store. So what's the mental model I spoke about, like uh, um, how developers think, and even how users use applications? Well, we tend to talk about caches and things like that because that's really what they think. Like if anybody's built a React application or an iOS app, you just create some array how you usually get started. And I'm like, well, I want to put information here. So you know, I append to it, or I insert a key. And then maybe I want to display some information in my UI. So I, I do some sort of data binding. And this is a really nice mental model, because I can easily focus on my UX. But the problem is, as soon as you start to have a distributed system, that's a problem. 
So show of hands, who's heard of the CAP theorem? OK. Sometimes I go to non-AWS conferences and it's not that high a number, so that's good. And um, so you, know, you might be aware, CAP theorem is a fundamental concept in distributed systems where we think of uh, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And the rule is generally that you have to tr choose two, right? But on that mental model I just showed, how people are thinking about writing and reading the data in applications is not a distributed system, right? So they actually get all of these three properties. But let's look at what it actually is in practice, right? So if I have servers in the back end or services and I have a mobile or web app, we end up getting common terms that apply to all of these different boxes, right? So we have partitions, right? In many cases, the mobile and web app is the ultimate partition in a distributed system. We then get stores, right? These might be databases. And we put caches in front of these stores. And caches are not databases for a reason, right? However, most developers, because they have that just small bounce, bound in that constraint, end up treating caches like stores. And that's where they run into problems. We also have queues, uh, which help us kind of pass messages back and forth. So the whole motivation for why we wanted to solve this problem was to kind of take some of the learnings that we had on the back end and apply them to the client side. So right, these stores and these caches, they show up everywhere in computing, right? Um, we have CPU registers, uh, data structures that deal with them. And then when you start looking at how databases deal with these things, really it comes down to concepts like referential integrity and uh, relationship tracking, right? And you don't want to actually push that to mobile and web developers that are responsible for data flowing through your system, but they might not be safely updating it and managing these things, right? So what's a practical example of this problem? Where does this show up? Um, this is a, a GraphQL query, if you've never seen one before on the left. But think of it as anything. Like it, GraphQL really isn't important necessarily here. But for most people that are trying to deal with state and data, they end up binding some query to a, a, to a, um, a result set in a local cache and then displaying that in their UI. And then they go offline, or they have a slow network or something else and somebody does an update to that item, right? You expose some control to the user. So let's say the category is updated to cat. But this is a problem because you're not actually running queries locally. Queries are happening in the back end in your database. So now you get some inconsistency and your UI is showing false data. And this shows up all over the place. And now imagine this is relationships with like a has to or a belongs to or a one to n or an m to n. And the problem gets even worse if you're trying to update or delete data. So with Amplified Data Store is what we announced yesterday, and this is what I'm going to dive deep into. We wanted to solve these problems, right? So it, it, it kind of uh, revolves around a few key concepts. The first is we want to apply that mental model to the local device to where developers just have this repository. And they can write to it, they can update items, they can query, and they can observe on items as well. The other thing is we wanted to power this in a way to take advantage of all the modern web techniques, right? Because um, some of those reasons why people were using these caches with GraphQL queries is because they wanted to evolve and they wanted to take advantage of all the benefits that GraphQL gives you, such as controlling the network state, you know, um, choosing what fields that you want to get down to your clients. So Amplified Data Store is powered by GraphQL on the back end. And that type system that GraphQL gives you from AppSync is what we use to rationalize and do serialization over the network. So you'll see we effectively use GraphQL as a network protocol under the covers with Amplified Data Store. We also learned a whole bunch of lessons with these concepts like delta changes to clients and delta sync. And then we wanted to deal with the concurrency issues of multiple clients that were updating the same objects at, uh, simultaneously. And this is another area that GraphQL gave us a whole lot of benefits to make some smart inference and choices on objects. Because a lot of the ways that people tackle these um, with other systems aren't really scalable if you look at things like operational transforms or CRDTs. So I'm going to talk about some of the unique ways that we think we've come up to, with on solving these problems. Then I'll demo some of this as well. All right, so what's the architecture here? So the way that data store works is it all comes, we, we, it, it all revolves around the programming concept of dealing with your data model, right? And what we did decide is, GraphQL, especially GraphQL schema definition language, is the perfect way for customers to do data modeling in their applications. 
And it's also the perfect way for us to solve this problem in a cross-platform manner. And the idea is that developers define their data model, then we translate these models into what's needed for both the local storage repository as well as for the back end for, for interacting with AppSync. So I'll walk you through this in detail. First is I, I create just a, a schema in my data model. And we, we went to the nth degree on this as well. So you don't even need to start with nothing. Uh, if you are on a JavaScript based application, we have an NPX script. It's just, you know, navigate into your directory and do npx amplify-app. If you are using Android Studio, we have a bunch of Gradle plugins now that are published to Maven. So you just add these two lines and do a Gradle sync. If you're using Xcode, we then ha we have a, a plugin as well that's published to CocoaPods. And then you just have a custom build phase that we add into your app. And so you just run a build. And out of that, we take this data model and we generate the language construct of choice. So we'll generate TypeScript classes, we'll generate JavaScript schemas. In the case of Java, we will generate Java POCOs, and we add a whole bunch of annotations to the POCO itself. And then at runtime, we inspect these using reflection to know what the schema looks like and things like that. We also use a lot of techniques to make developers' lives easier in the languages of choice with like step builders and things like that. Um, then in the case of Swift, because it doesn't have annotations, we attach some metadata to classes with protocols, so you get this really nice interface. But now those developers, they don't need to think about programming in GraphQL. They just create these model instances, so you can see here, new post, hello world, uh, rating of five. And I just operate on the data store API. So I save items, I update them, I can observe on models, things like that. And you'll also notice in that second line, I've got a query where I applied a, con a conditional predicate to this. And this is another unique feature that we did because you might have seen some other local data stores for clients in the past and they act their ergonomics are a little bit backwards from how it should be because they will apply the predicates and then they'll have you pass the fields into it. Instead, because we have this code generation process and it's based off of the GraphQL type, we know if things are strings or integers or floats or lists. And then we can dynamically choose the fields and give you type inference so that you can just have that field and select like a begins with or contains and then put in your condition that you're checking against. So again, it gives you this really nice mental model of programming for developers to code against. So let's talk about first the vertical slice of the architecture. So I created that model instance. And then what happened is the library decomposed that model instance using reflection or other techniques and creates in what we call a storage engine component a registry. So it's a registry of models. Then there's an adapter. So we use a classic repository pattern here to convert this into the persistence layer of choice. So this is not a database, it's a data store. This is a key difference. And by using that adapter pattern, we're able to do a couple of things. One, we can choose the right database for the platform of choice. So um, what we just shipped the past couple days is on JavaScript apps for web. Uh, it's using IndexedDB. We could choose that to be something else in the future. On iOS and Android, we then serialize these to SQLite. It also allows us, we'll release you know, in the coming weeks, um, we're going to take those SQLite adapters because it's in this plugin, and we can use this on React Native as well. So we get a lot of benefits with fast reads and writes to the React Native storage engine. Um, it's also going to give us some benefits in the future when people want to publish their own adapters, right? So if you have your own database du jour, you still have this nice programming model and just plug in adapter because this is all open source. There's a critical thing I'd like to point out here. You can just use this in your apps with no AWS account. So if you just want offline storage with a nice way to do data modeling and programming against and all these filters, you do not have to use an AWS backend at all. However, let's say that I started as a developer and I'm iterating and things like that and now I've got this data model and I'm happy with it. You just need to turn on one of those flag, or literally a flag in one of those NPM build scripts or, or like your Gradle switch, a flag that says sync enabled equals true, and you run a build. And this is pretty unique because we flipped code generation and how customers program against GraphQL on its head. Because if you're familiar with GraphQL programming languages uh, using some of the open source tools where you would take your GraphQL schema and then some queries, that would output the programming uh, types in like Swift or Java or TypeScript. Instead, the back end now becomes a function of your client with this model to where I started programming locally and now we generate an AppSync back end. 
We generate DynamoDB backends as well. I'll talk to you uh, in a minute about what that table structure looks like. And then the device starts syncing immediately. So I think we've lost the screen here. There they go. All right. So what happens is I talked about that middle layer with the model registry. And similarly how we translated at runtime the model registry to the storage engine of choice, to the, to the database, we then dynamically on the horizontal layer translate all these models to GraphQL statements. So we set up GraphQL queries, mutations, subscriptions, and then we dynamically do this, or we reverse the serialization process when we get responses. So if you had, for instance, a GraphQL query or a subscription that brought data to the device, we'll serialize that into a model and push that back up to the developer. So the developer, again, if they're observing on models, anytime updates come in from the network, it hits this storage engine and they know about it. The reason they know about it is because we use an observer pattern for the data store and the sync engine. They're both observing the storage engine. It's publishing messages out. Now that's kind of interesting. I started just locally. Let's say I started on my JavaScript application and I was building that and iterating and then I synced to the cloud. We released last week a feature that if you've seen the Amplify console you might have noticed which is called Amplify Pull. And when I do that push, the metadata, the schema itself, the GraphQL SDL, we automatically also create a local object effectively or an application inside Amplify console that is just stored as a repository for your schema assets. And so now if I go over to another system like Xcode or iOS and I want to use that same backend across all of these different clients, I'm able to just run, open up my terminal, I run Amplify Pull. It pulls down that same schema that was used from the originating clients, or now I'm in a team workflow with multi-environment, things like that. And again, I just run like a Gradle build or um, an Xcode build phase. It generates my Swift or Java classes, all based on that single schema source of truth. All right, so that's, that's the data store side. That's on the client. And now I talked about this being driven by uh, AppSync in the back end and GraphQL really powering the capabilities for us to do some of these things. Let's talk about what we, the changes that we made in AppSync to make this avail available to you. All right, there's two key things. The first is something that we call sync-enabled resolvers. And through these sync-enabled resolvers, we're able to effectively tag data and do conflict detection and resolution. So if you've ever looked at any synchronization protocols, whether they were on the back end or on the client, um, a lot of it comes down to different techniques of tagging objects with metadata. Um, you might have seen things like vector clocks in the, before, um, things like CRDTs or operational transforms. Um, these things have pros and cons, right? Some of them uh, sacrifice storing state in the service for a lack of associativity. Others give you strong associativity properties, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, clients at the same time, no matter the order that they came in, sending data to the service. But the problem here is usually you need to track state in the service for actors in the system. You get 10, 20, 30,000 clients, that's going to be a lot of data that you're tracking in databases. And as we know, state is hard. And what we do is we, we use a, a concept of monotonic counters with what I'd like to call loose versions that we attach to the objects themselves. And this gives us a couple of advantages. One is in the system, the only thing, when I'm talking about the system as a whole now, between clients and the back end, only thing that ever controls versions is app sync service. Clients just respect what comes from the service and then send their current state of the world, including with mutations, with updates. And this allows us to do some other things as well, like delta synchronization that I'll show you a diagram in a second. The other thing behind this, though, is we're able to detect conflicts not only on the objects themselves, but because we have GraphQL, we can make some smart decisions. So the first is we can just say, use a form of optimistic concurrency control to where you know, two writers happen or multiple writers happen. The latest write that's been committed to the database is what's accepted. And then we can give optional callbacks down to the clients. The other thing is we allow you to inject some business logic in there with AWS Lambda so that maybe even if that conflict occurred, you can look at the data itself and even the identity of the caller and see, well, is this like a moderator or someone named Jeff the Admin? You know, if so, allow their write to go back through to the system. 
The last one's um, a new technique that, that we've come up with the past six months. And I'm gonna walk you through a couple of examples and then show you a demo, where effectively we decompose your object as it's coming in, look at the fields in the GraphQL type, and on that layer, we look at the latest commit to the database and see, well, first of all, are, are these fields conflicting? If they're not, allow the union to be written. If the fields are conflicting, allow one of them to win. Or we can do different operations on lists as well, as well as sets, such as like concatenating the information on them. So let's first talk about these synchronous-enabled re resolvers before I go into some of the conflict resolution. So the first thing is, these, the, these sync-enabled resolvers on the query operation, um, they, they serve a couple of purposes. The first is that data store when it's the sync engine syncing with the back end, that's used to hydrate the data store on initial app start. Now, whenever the data store gets information from app sync, the contract in the sync protocol uh, says that it will send a record of the last synchronization time. So this is server-generated synchronization time and the clients will persist this on a per type basis. Then whenever they go online or offline, they come back on and they, they call that exact same app sync query, but pass in this time as an argument. App sync behind the scenes, whenever there's updates to data, will write to two tables. One is what we call that base table, the other one is what we call a delta table or a change journal. And the way that we partition this table is by time buckets that I'll talk about in a second. And it's what allows us to uh, optimally query that, that table and just return the last changed items. The other benefit of this is we have a global catch-up time that you as a developer can control in the, in, the, uh, in the data store itself. And this essentially acts as a global sweeper or garbage collection to give strong convergence properties. Finally, when we get data from the back end, you got to remember we're dealing with like offline mutations, queries, as well as subscriptions coming in. We sequence these in an order so that you get a three-way merge. And this is pretty important because if you have a high velocity system where there's a lot of writes coming in, so clients are getting updates, their versions might be out of order. This allows us to reconcile them in the appropriate way. All right, so let's talk about this delta sync first before we go into um, some of the other mechanisms. So I'm gonna talk about how updates happen and then look, take a, uh, a closer look at deletes. And these are, these are very nuanced problems, especially when you're dealing with client synchronization. So the first thing is, do you even need some sort of delta synchronization on, on your project? Can I just, um, if I've got a mobile or web app every time I go online or offline or just a couple days, just run big queries to sync? And usually people say they can and they build some prototype in their lab and then they get into production. And I can tell you for a fact, we have dealt with a lot of customers over the past two years with production applications. You might have seen Aldo Shoes last year present at reInvent. Even if you've got a really high powered iOS or Android phone or something else, you get dozens and dozens of records back and want to filter them to just the last changes on the client. That eats up CPU cycles and you see lags in your performance. Because you got to remember, UIs only support 60 frames per second. So just trying to iterate on those locally is, is going to um, cause some disruption to your customer base. The other problem is if you're dealing with JavaScript apps, right? It's problem's even worse because these things are single threaded. So you're going to have some blocking operations that happen if you do this. So how do we do this, this process? Well, the first part is I'm going to walk you through kind of a write and then the delta queries. So I have a sync-enabled resolver, and I'm going to use data store.save. I do that dynamic model generation and write to the back end. The app sync sync resolver will look at this. This is an updated or a new item. And if it's a new item, it's just going to write to both databases, versions equals one. If it happened to be an update post, it's going to appropriately, if it passes conflict detection, um, increment the version itself and respond to the clients, as well as do subscriptions. Now you'll notice, um, I kind of did this for a reason, I've got three records, Nadia, Poncho, Shaggy, um, you know, IDs one, two, three, um, as well as two and three. And on the right hand side, we partition into these time buckets. So it's a combination of the GraphQL type. You can see also it's got the uh, timestamp on it, which is an ISO timestamp we apply. Then the sort key is bucketed as well with a combination of, a, of a, that type timestamp as well as the version and then the unique identifier from the original base table. And this lets us have uniqueness in our change journal as we're writing events there. Now we also uh, track all changes over time. So you can get some replay logic if you really wanted this to see what happened as people were making updates. 
Also note here that I've got a last changed at that the service generated and then a TTL value. So anytime in um, data store powered by these app sync features that we delete items, both in the delta table as well as the base table, we do soft deletes with TTLs using DynamoDB um, a TTL capability to evict the items. Uh, and what this means is that your partitioning is really efficient and you've got less items which get cleaned up over time. So in that delta table, we're automatically evicting items so that even though we're querying by an optimal pattern on time bucket, we're also giving you all your provision throughput that you need. So it's an automated process. So now a client, let's say from data store, comes online and it's never gotten items before. It's going to pull all this information that it needs to from the base table. Under the covers, data store to again do optimization for those client UIs, it will paginate through the records 100 at a time and we give you some controls like all the way up to five or 10,000 items, whatever you want to do there. But that gives you efficient network requests and again remember your UI can observe to these different models dynamically so it's going to load them. Now let's say that the client went online and offline but it wants to just get the changed records. Again, it's the exact same resolver that's sync enabled, but app sync in the back end is doing the intelligence of pulling just from the delta table. I'll also note that you can apply conditional filters to this as well, like if you just wanted to you know, filter on cats, for example. Last thing on this process, and um, I hope this kind of gets the point around, this is, this is more complex than people really think when it's in production. Deletes are effectively hard when you're trying to do synchronization. So let's say that you've got you know, 10,000 clients, maybe even 100,000 clients, and they're all going online and offline, maybe some for just a couple days, some for weeks. And I want to hydrate this down to the client at first, right? So I've now effectively replicated or synchronized down my, a couple of these records to the client. Now this client goes offline, and I delete an item. What's going to happen? The client, it comes back online, it runs a query. It has no idea the item's been deleted, right? It needs some sort of marker, especially if it's soft deleted. So we were talking about consistency in the cap theorem before. This is how these things show up in mobile and web clients. And it happens all the time. Let's, let's, let's try this another way. How do we do this with AppSync? Well, so now the client goes offline and we soft delete it. And by soft delete, what I mean is we put a marker on all the records as well as that TTL. And so now when data store comes back online, it's going to run a query. It's going to have the proper state because it can remove the item. And then, as I mentioned before, this is effectively a global garbage collection process that's happening across all your clients. All right, let's switch to the last piece before I give you a couple of demos on these things. Conflict detection and conflict resolution. And this is definitely a topic that lots of people have um, a whole lot of unique opinions on uh, in the industry. And there's no silver bullet for this. Um, but there, there are techniques that you can do to, to get pretty close to you know, 90, 95% of success for your use cases. So as I mentioned before, the way that we do this in AppSync is with a series of monotonic counters. Right? So these, and you saw a little bit of this, that in that, that table I kind of showed. Um, and these are, again, controlled by the system. When the write comes through and somebody's going to you know, do an update to an item, maybe two clients at once, uh, we, inside the AppSync service, will do basically conditional checks against your DynamoDB records to see you know, what the race condition is, what the version is, and if they're allowed to work. It's also worth noting that any custom conditions that you apply from your clients, or maybe you use like the, the, the auth directive in the uh, GraphQL transformer that's part of Amplify, these will be applied as an AND statement as well. So when I was showing that filter, um, that, uh, that Fluent interface on the data store uh, for doing queries, you can also use that same Fluent interface for mutations and do conditional updates as well. That's an important consistency property of the system. And I'm going to talk about here in a second how we do uh, the GraphQL type information. So that's the first thing is uh, just kind of like um, a improvement on what we did before. We just do it automatically in the system. Um, with an optimistic concurrency control, right? So I have this entire object that I'm reading and writing, you know, posts with title and rating and things like that. Um, we track this in the base, base and delta tables. Two clients simultaneously do a write. One wins, one doesn't. Send a call back down to the client. 
Then the same thing with custom logic from Lambda. Well, let's look at this new technique that we have called auto merge, right? So I have this item in my DynamoDB table. So it's, uh, you know, dog information. Shaggy is six years old and he is a breed of beagle. And let's say I have two other clients that update some of this information simultaneously, right? So client A updates the age to 10. Um, the breed is updated on client B to miniature schnauzer. If I did this and I just use the naive form of OCC, I'm going to lose data on one of the clients and I need to do something about it. But since we are able to parse this object by the GraphQL AST, I can see one of these is a different field than the others. I also see that one of them is a string and the other is an integer. And I can wind up with a union of this result set. Additionally, as I mentioned before, since you can do conditions on updates, I could have applied a condition to one of these items as well, like maybe I wanted that first one to only do the right if the age happened to be still six, you know, something like that. So you can tweak this as your needs apply. This gets really interesting when you start looking at different types of uh, operations on lists. And I'm, when I say lists, I'm talking about the uh, GraphQL list, but we can also use this operation on DynamoDB lists and sets. And that's important if you want to uh, do deduplication or not, because you can have non-deduping with Dynamo lists, and we can do deduping with auto merge by using DynamoDB sets. So in this example, let's say I started with that record on the right, um, but Shaggy was first interested in toys. The other clients, you know, are voting maybe or something like this and saying, well, Shaggy's also interested in cats and dinner. Now, when they both write, we can concatenate the items so we get no data loss and we get the results set that we want on the right-hand side. All right, that's enough talking. Let's, let's look at a bit of what this looks like. Okay. So I'm going to take you through a few operations and a little bit of code. This is level 400, what can I say? So um, I'm going to get deep into a little bit of the technical uh, bits. So the first is, um, what I'm going to do is create an item over here. So what I've got here is a um, create React app um, written in TypeScript. And I'm going to zoom in on this in a second. Um, and I'm going to go into the code and show you how it works in a moment here. But first, I'm going to take you through the application just to see the flow. So this Create React app, um, let me make this slightly bigger, all right? So I've got it running in Chrome. Um, one of these is running in uh, incognito mode. As I mentioned before, in JS, we use IndexedDB, so that's why I don't want to share the databases. On the left-hand side, this will be a create operation. Um, in fact, just really quick, I'll show you my schema here. I've got, um, this is actually a many-to-many -many example, but I'm going to sh only show you one side of the reference right now. Um, but I've got a post, it's got a title, rating, status. The status is an enum of draft, rejected, and published. And then note, I've got these tags, which are a list of strings, right? Because I want to show some auto-merge stuff here in a second. So on the upper left-hand side, um, this will be how I create an item, right? So I will do um, data store demo. Oh, this is going to be a rating of 10 for sure. This one's published because we launched yesterday. And it'll have a tag of amplify. I create this, right? Notice it went all the way through the back end. I'm actually using USD tier. Um, created a record on the other item. If I go to my app sync console, just to show you that it's been written, I can do a list operation here. And just to show you some of these fields, get the last change that that just came back. Right, so you can see the details here. Let me do another one. I will do app sync, rating of five. This one's a draft. This one is GraphQL as a tag. And I will do AWS Lambda. this a couple times. Yeah, why not? This one's going to be rejected. No, I won't do that to Lambda. I can't do that. Sorry. Um, I'll do serverless. Right, so I've got a few items. Now, 
I'll also turn my Wi-Fi off. And let's do title. So this is where I'm going to show the Fluent interface when I get into the code. Title contains, and we'll do app sync. I query this. See how fast that is? I'm offline going against the local data store. Maybe I will do less than this time. I don't remember what numbers I did. I'll do 11 for this. So it got me just those two items. I think the other one I did was something like 15. Yep, got all the records. Right, so you can see the Fluent interface and how we're converting these model instances, and I'll show you in the code in a second, hitting the local data store. Let me come back online. This is a risky demo. I should have done the online stuff first. We'll see. Hey, it worked. Right, I've got some of these items, and you'll notice the deleted here is not populated. If I wanted to delete one of these, let me actually show you the soft deletes. Yeah, I'll just do a delete all. all. Right, it's populating through these. See it going through that mutation queue on the sync engine, sending to the back end all the way through US East. If I came back over here to the app sync console, I did a list. Right now you can see the deleted flags true. If you wanted to see what it was like in the Dynamo table itself, right, here are those tags, the type name, status. There's my deleted at, the TTL, set on the table, everything. And this happens to be the post table. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you. And we named these amplified data store with, a, with effectively the same model. So even in my change set over here of my journal, these also get deleted and they'll get cleaned up. While we're here, let me just show you really quick. If you looked in the apps and console before I show you auto merge, You'll notice the data, store, data sources now have been updated. So you can see we've got this data source versioning. And you can not only control the tables, but you can set the TTL. So that TTL is by default set on what, what you want your DynamoDB table to start evicting items. So for instance, what we do by default is it's 30 minutes, I think, we set for uh, your, your change journal once the items are deleted and that TTL record is available. On your base query table, we do 30 days. And this allows you to control what you need on how fast your clients are going online and offline. So if you have an app where clients are going online and offline very rapidly, you might want to set very aggressive TTLs. If you're going on a cruise ship or something else, maybe you want six months of TTL or something, right? It's kind of like pick your poison here. So let me come back over to this queries. And I think I can tile these. All right, so I'm going to show you a little bit of auto merge. All right, so I showed you, um, you know, some of the records before. And this time, Nadia is going to do a post where Nadia loves naps. And her rating's seven. It's in draft, and she's got cats, right? So here's all the fields that I'm going to send down to the client. I do an add. You can see it created it on the back end, came down to the client, full subscription coming through. All right? Now if I show you here. What I'm going to do this time is, on the left-hand side, I'm going to update this ID. And I did this specifically with the idea of copying it in, just so you could see the process on how it works. All right, so I created an item. And I'm going to put, Nadia also has an interest in dogs. So I'm going to update this. You can see it got updated in both. Come back over to the console here. Just to show you, I'm going to run this list operation so you get to see it again. Nadia loves naps, cats, and dogs. Looks good so far, right? Let's mix this up a little bit just to show some of these consistency problems that happen with these offline systems. So now I'm going to simulate multiple clients, and one of these I'm going to go offline. So this is why I'm using Chrome for this one, right? So this client on the right is offline. And now, I'm going to take this same ID, again, developer mental model. And I'll show you how this append works in a second locally. And I'll do panda. 
So I do, I'm not doing append. This time I'm doing an overwrite. But you can see it hasn't been updated over here. If I go back to the AppSync console, because this client's offline, and I run that again. Uh, Nadia loved naps, cats and dogs. So now on the left-hand side, let's say that I wanted cats, dogs, and, um, oh, I don't know, um, mice. Cats, dogs, mice. I still have this state that I made over here when I was offline. Again, go back to the console. Cats, dogs, mice. All right, let's do a little magic now. This client over here was offline, made that data. What's going to happen? I didn't lose any data, right? Auto merge detected this, saw the different versions, decomposed that GraphQL type, and then concatenated them at the end, right? And again, just to call this out, this one here that I'm doing is I'm actually using um, a set operation. You could use a list or not, but I did that because I didn't, I didn't want to do, do duplicate on the client or anything else. So we give you a lot of unique controls. And this is just one example, right? So if these were uh, scalar fields inside of your GraphQL type, you could do unions of those, replacements. You can also do conflict resolution just on those types. Um, and we're, we're actually releasing the documentation on this today. So you'll see the, the, the rule set in the AppSync documentation on how these algorithms work. All right, let's, let's look at a little code now. I should have probably quit that. All right, so this is the application that I just showed you. One second. And what I did here, let me make this a little bit bigger for you. So the way you get started is all you need to do is add Amplify Data Store, in including you're just doing the local only mode. And from there, what happens is when you run that NPX script, like I was saying, Amplify-app, uh, it will do code generation process. So just to show you how the code generation looks, I'll actually expand over here. And you'll see in here we've got these models, right? So this is, the, this is what it looks like on the... JavaScript and TypeScript side. Um, if you looked in here, we, we generate all of the type hints, not only just for TypeScript projects, but actually for JavaScript uh, projects as well. So like you can use VS Code and other things to get all the nice code completion and so forth. Um, then we create these model schemas. And this is actually how, excuse me, this one. This is actually how that, in the JavaScript side, how that model registry is formed in that middle layer in the storage engine by decomposing this. It's also how in React Native, now that we're publishing the iOS and Android uh, storage engines to Maven and CocoaPods, how it will use that same uh, code base with the JavaScript pieces speaking to the native bridges. So if I come back over here now, what I'm going to show you is I'm, I'm not really going to focus on the React piece of this. Like if you were to look at this app, and I'll probably send it online sometime. You'll, you'll see this is normal. What am I using here? Um, semantic UI. So most of this is just the, the majority of this application, which did all the complex stuff, is, is straight up React components, right? So I've got some on-change things that run this specific uh, new post function. I've got um, another one that will do setting post in, with React hooks, um, some functional components there. Um, I've got other ones that will do the queries for the ratings and things like that. But like, if I were just to show you this API, like, here's the query one. But let me actually here in the create one show you something. Right, so, so you'll, need to, you'll need to await on all of your data store calls because these return a promise. But just to show you here, if I, just uh, the programming API. Right, so first of all, that nice code completion you can see, right? Configure, delete, observe, query, clear. We give you some controls, too, around things like um, clearing the, the local data store. And this is super important if you've got applications where you're concerned about multiple users logging on and you might have some privacy information. Clearly, there's only so much we can control on the browsers themselves, right? So you need some controls, like if you want to just blow away all the information locally and then rehydrate. We give you those as well. But let's say that I was going to create something. 
So I do data store.save, right? And I pass in this model instance. And now I actually want to do, oops. Actually, I can do it another way. Let me show you a little bit of this. So the reason I showed it this way by passing the instances in is, again, because we did all that dynamic code in information, we give you all the type hints based on the GraphQL schema, right? So you can really see the, the benefit of a strongly typed API with all that information, like kind of going both ways, right? It goes one way in the back end for the service to know the types as they're coming through and make smart decisions on merging updates on items. It goes the other way all the way down to the developer tooling and in our storage engine of allowing us to persist this information in an intelligent way. And so for here, right, I, I know that it's gonna be things like, you know, title, right, my post, stuff like that, I could complete that here. Now the more interesting one is I showed you some of these different query operations, right? So if I wanted to do, I could do data store dot query, and I want to listen for posts, but I can also give this nice functional interface, and it knows that this post is going to have not only top level operations, so by default, the Fluent interface is an or statement, but if I wanted to, I could wrap it all in an and. And then I can go down to those fields, right? So for instance, uh, let's look at the title. That's a string. And so for string operations, oops, it will let me do things like equality. It'll let me do things like um, uh, contains, begins with, stuff like that which would be a little bit different if I looked at some lists. All right, so maybe I look at the tags. And for tags, right, I'd actually have to go to the subset and I can know if something contains or not, right? So again, this all comes down to developer ergonomics and starting locally on the device and then building this all to the back end. Okay, couple more things I wanna show. Um, one thing I will show really quick, um, just in essence of time for the session, um, I'll just show you a little bit of documentation here. Um, we even do the same thing, I'll show you the Swift one and then you can go online and check out, because uh, we just published them a little bit of the, the Java version for uh, Android and iOS. So the, the Android and iOS clients are part of the new Amplify Native launch that we did yesterday as well. So this is a preview release, uh, which means that um, it's got most of the functionality there, and you'll see like the gap closing here in the coming month or so on all of the features and functionality. But we'd really encourage you to go play with it here over the next month and give us some feedback. But the, the, what we re but the, the whole local um, piece and much of the sync engine piece is all functional there, which is kind of interesting when you look at the programming model. So if you've ever you know, written in Swift before, for example, you can see some similar operations. So I will just import Amplify. Saving data is the same thing. Amplify data store dot save in Swift, and I pass in a model instance, and I can switch on a couple of cases. If I wanted to query data, very similar. I could just pass in an entire model instance, or I can apply some pretty query predicates there. So like I can look at the rating greater than four, and then since we're using Swift, we even have functional interfaces. Like I can do a where statement, and this where is a closure, that I can do like p dot rating dot greater than and stuff like that. So you get all of the nice predicates from the language itself as well as the functional interfaces. Um, the other thing I'd encourage you to, to check out here on the actual Amplify site, um, again, just in terms of time, if you look at the data store documentation, you will notice all of what I just showed you, but also an entire section on relational models. And this is super important as well because if you notice when I was talking about the differences between data stores and caches, right? If you've ever dealt with any caches locally on the client and you wanna do like a post with comments or many to many situations and things like that, um, you have to do a whole lot of machinery with deleting all the references on the system, either that or you end up with, with broken UX or extra data on the client. And with, with relations and amplified data store, the querying is exactly like you saw before, you know, I can filter on those IDs, but I can delete single items 
And for instance, in the one-to-many situation, we will actually do cascading deletes throughout the local data store on the system, as well as send those to the back end if you want to. So again, we really try to take the extra effort here to think about the developer ergonomics. The last thing I want to show you, um, just a couple of pieces under the cover, is you know I was writing and reading to these tables while this was going on. And if you look at these Dynamo consoles, so I'll come back over here, and this was a post table, right? You can see the version kept on getting incremented, right? So again, we're not, this, this is your data. We're just, you know, augmenting it for you with some controls in front of it, but you own and operate your own data in this system. It's not an obscure database or anything like that. Um, and you can see how the IDs, well, here, I'll show you the time buckets in a second, but for like delete operations, as I was mentioning, right? You'll have deleted is equal to true. We'll automatically configure DynamoDB TTLs for you. So it's your own data that you're controlling. And then if I were to show you that partitioning scheme that we use, right, you can see the combination of these time buckets when those delta sync queries were running. And the final thing there, just to show you how this works on the resolvers. Right, so the sync posts is exactly that new operation like that I showed you before, sync. It just matters if you get that last sync time or not, and the resolver is smart enough to pull from one of the other tables. And then the really cool thing is if you look at the mutations, like our update post, you'll notice we give you those controls here. Conflict detection, and then we automatically do the ending process of any extra conditions that you pass in as predicates, as well as allow you to select um, auto merge or optimistic concurrency, or your own custom Lambda function from your account that you want. And our documentation also gives you nice information on what a custom Lambda would look like. So it, it really is actually the custom Lambda is just a resolve or reject. In the resolve, you're just passing the same information back or augmented, whatever you want this JavaScript object to look like. And then again, we control the versions inside the system. All right. So with that, that's really what I wanted to go through today. Um, so I'll be around for a few minutes, and hopefully you guys try it out. And if you have any questions or concerns, um, Amplify is an open source project, so please log something on the repo. Thank you.